This is Keys to the Shop, episode 297, making coffee education fun with the founder of Leaderboard Coffee, Sunil Pabari. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host for the show. As always, I am thankful to have you along today to listen to this episode. You know, we come out with a lot of episodes every month, and to be updated when new ones come out, you just need to subscribe to Keys to the Shop. Just hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Um, It would be great for you to share these episodes with a friend, or maybe you know of another coffee shop owner that uh, doesn't necessarily know about Keys to the Shop and might benefit from some of the content and our interviews on the show. It'd be awesome if you'd introduce them to Keys to the Shop. Keys to the Shop is brought to you in part by Keys to the Shop Consulting, where I get to work directly with you to establish a new thriving coffee shop or to help you level up the operations, people, and quality of your existing coffee shop. There's a lot of ways that we can do that, whether remotely over the phone or on site through cafe assessments and trainings. And there's probably something that works for you. And I'd love to talk with you about what that might be. So if you want to set up a free discovery call with me, just email me at chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. And we can figure out if uh, working with keys to the shop consulting is right for you. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers, bringing you the best equipment from all over the world and working with you one-on-one to help you select the right equipment for your context, for your cafe. That's a big deal because it's kind of stressful spending that much money on equipment. This is the stuff that's going to make your business run. Prima knows that. That's why they work so hard at getting you the right equipment. Go to prima-coffee.com slash keys to find out what I mean. And now you can get 5% off your entire order over at prima-coffee.com slash keys. When you use the code keys5 at checkout, That's the code K-E-Y-S and the number five at checkout. Get 5% off your entire order. A super generous offer from great people. If you're in the market for commercial coffee equipment, then I would highly recommend you go check out prima-coffee.com slash keys. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series, the number one plant-based performance beverage in the world, in my opinion, and in the opinion of thousands of other people, professionals, world-class baristas. This stuff is made for them and tested by them to make sure that when you get it on your bar, it stands up to the heat from steaming, produces an awesome texture for latte art, and creates a balance in the beverage that keeps everything focused on your awesome coffee. Your customers will love this, and there's a reason why professionals prefer the barista series. Go check them out over at pacificfoodservice.com. Get this in your store and try it for yourself. If you're looking for variety, performance, quality, then the choice is clearly the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, today we're talking about making coffee education fun with somebody who is really doing a lot to help in that cause. Sunil Pabari is the founder of Leaderboard Coffee. Leaderboard's coffee's goal is to educate enthusiasts and challenge professionals and bring the community together. And they do this through Leaderboard Coffee in creating a tasting competition with a variety of world-class coffees shipped right to your door tasted collectively. There's always one winner per season. It's a really fun concept because you've got professional coffee tasters and just home enthusiasts. You can see them all on the leaderboard. Sometimes, you know, enthusiasts beating professionals and identifying these 10 coffees that are shipped to you. And that process of competition does wonders to help educate people about different types of coffees, processing methods, what different roasters there are out there. And today we're going to be talking all about, you know, the founding of this and the kind of fruit that Sunil has seen come from uh, this competition as it relates to the community. And we'll talk a lot about making coffee education not only fun, but also accessible and the kind of things that Sunil believes we need to embrace to see a brighter future in specialty coffee. Sunil is not only the co-founder of Leaderboard Coffee, but also the Roasters Pack, Matchmaker Coffee, and this coffee company. So he's a lot of experience in subscription services. So I'm excited to share this with you. Here now is my interview with the co-founder of Leaderboard Coffee, Sunil Pabari. Well, Sunil, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Really glad to have you on the show. 
Chris, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, um, super interesting website and and uh, company and what you do over at Leaderboard Coffee is um, it sounds really fun and the website's awesome as well. Uh, real retro. I appreciate that as a an older <laughs> person myself. Um, but yeah, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a ton of fun to put together. Uh, we wanted to try and give it like an interesting vibe, so we had a little bit of fun with uh, with the aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, you're, you've got your hands in a lot of different things in coffee. Um, you're, you've started uh, subscription services in Canada, and um, you, you've just really kept busy, and it's been about seven years of being in coffee, correct? That's correct, yeah. And so how did, what's your background? Uh, how did that start? Like, how did your coffee career start, and what has kept you in it for, for these years? I think I was just kind of like most people where – you have that first cup of specialty coffee and you're kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? This is kind of interesting. It's a little bit different than what we normally drink, at least up here in Canada. Coffee is pretty much dominated by Tim Hortons, uh, which isn't necessarily the most interesting cup of coffee. So once you have a specialty cup, I think it kind of like opens your world up to being like coffee can taste different and interesting. Um, so that was the start for me. I had some interesting coffee. Um, the only challenge was I didn't live in like a specialty coffee hub. Um, I lived kind of in the burbs just outside of Toronto. There was only one good roaster around. Um, and so for me, I wanted to explore. I wanted to try more coffees, but it was just super challenging. Uh, up here in Canada, when I started in coffee back in 2014, specialty coffee was quite sparse. So that's uh, initially what led me into coffee and what got me starting my first uh, coffee company, which was a coffee subscription service called the Roasters Pack, where every month we send people three different coffees from different craft roasters. So just kind of scratching my my own itch with specialty coffee. Okay. So you, your experience of having that wow factor, uh, you know, that like this is specialty coffee, you wanted to, it sounds like this, like the basis for doing this for other people through your subscription service. Yeah. Well, initially it was like, I want to get my hands and I want to get my hands on other coffees and try other coffees. Um, and the only real way of doing that is like to drive into different roasters in the city, which is like, was like an hour drive for me. Um, or like buy a lot of coffees from different roasters online. But even back in 2014, 2013, like e-commerce wasn't necessarily the most prevalent thing. So for myself, it was like a major challenge. It was like pretty tricky to do that. I was hearing about all these cool roasters out on the West Coast, and it wasn't super easy for me to get my hands on their coffee. Like some of them didn't even have websites set up for, you know, like e-commerce capabilities. So it, I figured like for myself, this was such a challenge. And then I figured, hey, if I'm having this problem, I wonder if there's other people out there. So that was kind of what led to the inception of the Roasters Pack and starting the coffee subscription service. Um, and uh, eventually it turned out that, yeah, there were other people who like were kind of having the same problem as me and wanted to get their hands on good coffee in Canada. Okay. So as you develop the service, you probably ended up learning a lot more about coffee beyond what, if you had just continued to be a consumer of coffee. I mean, what did you really end up learning about coffee and the community of, of coffee, maybe you know, both professionals and consumers? I Well, I learned a ton. Um, I think like being a quote unquote wholesale client gave me maybe a little bit more confidence to ask a lot more questions. Uh, and, and it gave me access to some really, really smart and talented coffee professionals. So, you know, whenever we would buy a coffee for the roasters pack, I could pester them with a ton of questions under like the guise of journalism. So with the roasters pack, we try to send people coffees, but we also want to tell the story behind the coffee and explain what makes this coffee interesting. So when doing that write up, you need to ask the roaster like, hey, why, what did you try and do in the roast? Why is this processing interesting or relevant? Or how does the high altitude impact the cup? And when you're asking all these questions, it, it was kind of like the best learning for me in coffee, just because I got to reach out to the smartest green buyers, head roasters in Canada and, and get to pester them and ask them a ton of questions about their coffees. Yeah, I mean, that access is really interesting. Um, sometimes I feel similar uh, as a podcaster. Um, totally. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when you're looking at the industry and being exposed to it as and, and getting feedback from people that are getting these subscription services, like what what are you getting from them in terms of 
how they experience the coffee. So there's how you experience the coffee, but then the people that get the subscriptions, was it accomplishing what you wanted it to accomplish? And, and what kind of feedback were you getting from people that were exposed to all this great coffee? Totally. Um, so for myself, uh, like I want to try and recreate some of those experiences that I was having with the roasters. And so we put a ton of effort into the content and making sure we're telling the stories that we think are really interesting with coffee. So even like when I would go to coffee shops, let's say you buy a bag, there's so much that goes into that bag of coffee, but I find, you know, you don't necessarily get to learn that story. And so with us, what we're, we're trying to do is tell that story, like interview the green buyer and understand how they came across this coffee and share that with the consumer at home. And now the end consumer, I think the challenge is, is like, how do we create compelling content that is like fun for them to read while they're waiting for their kettle to boil? Or how can we recreate that like really cool cafe experience for people at home? And so, you know, those were always the questions we were trying to ask with the experience. And so it kind of led us down to like, we want to have a lot of quotes from the roasters. We want to try and hear their story directly to make it feel like this individual, they might live in rural Alberta, but they still get to have that like really cool specialty coffee experience. Um, so for us, it was like really in depth on the storytelling and then also figuring out like, what can we do uh, to bring that cafe experience to their home? So each month we'll try and dive into like maybe something slightly different in terms of the topic. So a couple months ago, we included like perfect coffee water, which is like those little water sachets because in Canada, I honestly have no idea how someone's water in PEI will compare to someone in rural Saskatchewan versus someone in Toronto. And I think like having that conversation on water, I think is really interesting for the end consumers at home. Mm -hmm. uh, other things that we'll do is we'll be like, okay, um, drum roaster out in Cobble Hill, if you were to brew this coffee on V60 at your coffee shop, how would you brew it? And so we'll try and include those brew guides for people at home so they can try and recreate that full experience. Um, and I think that like the end consumer really appreciates just that little added touch, you know, to be able to hear the story behind the coffee or be able to understand how they could brew it best from people who've spent a lot of time trying to dial this coffee in. Uh, so I think it's just the little touches like that that I think people appreciate because stuff like that isn't necessarily the easiest to get your hands on. No, sure. So they are responding well, it sounds like. They, they, they feel like they're able to brew better coffee because of those little touches and the access to this great coffee. Totally, totally. Okay. Well, I mean, you mentioned the access to education, and um, I, I, there sounds like um, there's a gap that you're trying to fill in in what you're doing, especially with like leaderboard coffee. Um, what what is that gap or the problem in the coffee education that you see, and why is that gap there? I think that like I try and be like a little bit of a guinea pig, or at least I try and put myself in the shoes of someone who's trying to learn more about coffee. Mm -hmm. And like for myself, I found it, um, I felt quite privileged to be able to have the opportunity to like bug the best and smartest coffee people in Canada and ask them my mundane coffee questions about like, Hey, what's the deal with this white honey processed coffee? Um, how does that change from yellow honey? You know? Uh, and I think that if someone's trying to learn more about coffee, they won't necessarily have access to these really talented baristas or green buyers or head roasters. And so I, I don't know, I always look and think like, okay, so if I was a, you know, new barista or a new coffee professional trying to further myself in my career, what would I be able to do? And so you could probably watch some YouTube videos, you could probably read some books, you could listen to Keys to the Shop, you know, <laughs> uh, there's some good resources, but I still think that like the experiences that I had were amazing. Like. I want to try and give people that opportunity to have like these one-on-ones with coffee professionals. So with leaderboard coffee, one of the most integral parts of it was what we call our coaches. So I reached out to like some of the smartest people I know in coffee. And I was like, Hey, can you do a deep dive on this specific topic? Uh, and the intention was to try and make that like one-to-one -one experience I had to make it from a one-to-one -to, -one to a one-to-many. So as many people would have access to like Tim Wendelbo talking about you know, what he's diving into, or, you know, some of the smart people at Passenger Coffee talking about how body and origin impact the cup profile. So, yeah, I, I think that like education in coffee is something that still needs a lot of work and a lot of love. And with Leaderboard, we were trying to pair the sensory experience with the education. 
So I think there's a lot of really good books that you could read, but it's tough to just read a book and not taste the coffee at the same time. Um, and, and with leaderboard, it's a, it's a game, it's a competition. And so there's a lot of like effort you really have to put into tasting. I Explain think can... a little bit about, uh, what leaderboard is then. Totally. Yeah. So, um, leaderboard coffee is a game that we created about, uh, eight months ago. I started this coffee game with my good buddy, Grant Gamble. Uh, and we sent people 10 coffees blind and we asked them questions about the coffees. So questions like, where do you think this coffee was grown? What varietal do you think it is? How do you think it was processed? Do you think it was grown above or below 1600 meters above sea level? Is it a decaf? Um, and so there's a hundred points up for grabs. The top 20 scores get on the leaderboard, top five scores win prizes. And it's kind of turned into this like international coffee competition, which is pretty sweet. So we just shipped out our second edition of the game and we do this every quarter. So we just shipped out season two and there's around 300 to 400 people participating in season two uh, from all around the world. So people were based here in Canada. So we had a lot of Canadians, but we also had people from in the States, uh, people from Hong Kong, uh, the Philippines, Mexico, Sweden, Slovakia, it kind of turned into this little international coffee competition. And so, you know, it's part a coffee competition, part uh, a coffee tasting because you have to try 10 coffees blind and then part education. So with each question, we wanted to pair it with uh, an educational piece of content. So if you're trying to learn more about processing while you're tasting and trying to figure out processing, we have a couple of videos on processing from some really smart coffee people that'll hopefully help you learn more while you're tasting these coffees. Nice. Nice. Uh, so it sounds like it's growing. Um, the response has been good. It seems. Yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. You know, you start something, you never really know how people are going to respond to it. Uh, in your head, you're like, I think this is a cool idea. Hopefully the world thinks so as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, but no, it's been really awesome to see the response. Um, I don't think I've, you know, at the end of our, when we ask people to submit their answers, the last question is like, did you have any feedback for us or what'd you think? And I don't think I've worked on a project that has been so unanimously loved, which is really cool to see. Like the feedback is super positive and, you know, it's, it's something that I think we're like, we're kind of blown away by how, how much people are loving the experience. Well, who's participating? So that's been the really interesting thing to see too. So we have um, a lot of coffee roasters or green buyers. So people from like like Dakota at Onyx Coffee Lab, he's the green buyer there. He was participating since season one. Um, we have a lot of uh, like people who've previously done well in cup tasters as well, who are also participating. But then we also have people who are just like really passionate about coffee and wanting to learn more. So it's kind of like this interesting range of, um, coffee enthusiasts, just like home drinkers to the very highest end of coffee professionals. And I think that kind of makes it a little bit fun from a competition point of view too, because, you know, for the leaderboard, each time we've had coffee professionals be on there, but we've also had people who, you know, aren't necessarily green buyers. They're just people who really like coffee. Uh, so it, it kind of makes it less of like an exclusive group. And it kind of is, it's pretty cool to see that, like just a normal non-coffee professional person can also make it on the top 22. Yeah, I was going to say it'd be interesting to see if, or maybe this has happened where somebody who's like a professional taster or green buyer gets unseated by, you know, somebody in their garage coffee bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's uh, bound to happen, to be honest, with coffee because coffee is so challenging. Um, like I think we've all probably tasted coffees that, you know, maybe tastes like an Ethiopian natural. And it's for some reason, it's like a, you know, it's like a Brazil and you're like, how did this happen? You know? Mm -hmm. And that's just the thing with coffee. It's like so complicated. There's so much interesting stuff going on that you may think, you know, coffee, but it kind of, some things can twist you on your head. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's one of the beauties of making something accessible is, is creating sort of a, a, a mix of the professionals, the consumers, and, you sort of get the common uh, the common thread of being able to taste and enjoy great quality coffees. Um, I'm interested in what the gamification and competition aspect does to help with education and exploration. 
of of coffees. It seems with competitions and you know, like uh, barista championships and latte art competitions, and when you have games like this, uh, people tend to flock to it. Um, I wonder what your take is on what that does for people's ability to go deeper with information. That's that's a super good question about gamification. And I think Barista Comps is a perfect example of that. Uh, whenever I've talked to someone who's participated in Barista Comps, first of all, they always look like they've just been through like hell, literally. Like it looks like such an intense experience. And I always wonder like, why do they do this? Why do they put themselves through such a challenging time? And it's because they know that there's going to be so much learning from it. So I think just that little bit extra competition just forces people to take it a lot more seriously. And I think that's what we're noticing with leaderboard. Um, like there's a lot of public cuppings where people go to cuppings and they taste coffee, but the, the seriousness of how you take that cupping is very different when it's a competition and you really need to try and figure out what this origin is. Um, and I think just having this, these little bit of stakes, like having some prizes if you perform well or getting like the bragging rights of making it on the leaderboard just forces you to really take that slurp seriously and be like, okay, what am I tasting here? How's the acidity? What can we see? It's the variety, what's the variety look like? And I think by having this little competition, it forces people to really, really take their time with the coffee, really be able to try and put their taste thoughts into words. Um, and I and I hope that um, you know it can really expand someone's knowledge in terms of coffee tasting. Well, really, I think we're kind of seeing that. So yeah, it's really cool to see. Yeah, it's interesting um, that that urgency creates a more open mindset to exploration that maybe you didn't have before if you just had a lot of spare time and you were just hanging around your house. Uh, you, you might not voluntarily dive into processing methods. Um, and imagine a community aspect is also part of the process, you know, like I'm, I'm doing this with a bunch of other people because when, when you're professionals, even if you're consumers, you like to, you know, there's consumers that have their own groups. Um, you know, there used to be a lot of um, online forums for enthusiasts and there still mm-hmm. are, you know, coffeegeek.com is an example. Um, but you know, for professionals, a lot of times they're, the competitions are so, um, well received because they don't get to see very many people. Totally. <laughs> yeah. You're behind your machine or especially if you're a roaster or a cupper, uh, a green, bu- green buyer, you really are isolated in mm-hmm. your your little um, basement or back room. So I, I imagine that this community aspect of, of competition and or um, you know games is, is really part of it too. Totally. Yeah, we've seen some really cool um, cool things going on. So I know in New Zealand, uh, people are hosting like leaderboard cupping sessions. So they're bringing people together and they're able to taste coffee together and talk about them as a community. Uh, and, you know, especially for this past year with the pandemic, the community side of coffee really wasn't, it was so tough. It was almost non-existent. And I think leaderboard kind of helped fill a little bit of those gaps. So we saw people going on Instagram live, running through their leaderboard sessions. Um, and I think that was kind of a fun experience for people who were participating. We saw people putting up like YouTube videos, walking through how their thought process is for each coffee, trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even during the reveals, just like having people comment what they thought or how they did, uh, I think it was really cool to see. And I think it, it did bring the participants and players together. That's awesome. Yeah. And and so with having this kind of uh, platform for education, what are some of the logistical challenges that you face in putting together something like this so that your the quality control is there and you're organizing I mean, this this season of coffees, is it significantly challenging or what are the main things that uh, make this possible to run smoothly? <laughs> this is like, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm running a coffee company, but other times I feel like I'm running a logistics company or maybe it's like 90% logistics, 10% coffee. Uh, I think <laughs> some people ask me like what I do all day and I think they think I'm just like sitting around cupping coffees like 24 seven, which I wish my job was. Um, but it ends up being like a lot of coordinating, a lot of emails, a lot of like being very organized. So, you know, for example, with leaderboard, we have 10 different coffees. They're all around the world, which means we, diff- we need different row states to make sure we get it to us on time. Uh, once we get those 10 coffees in, we need to make sure 
uh, like everything is very well organized. So thankfully we've had a lot of practice with the roasters pack on the logistics side. We've been doing this for like seven years, shipping out a lot of coffee. So we've kind of got that side nailed in, but it definitely does, um, force us to be very well organized. Uh, shipping internationally is sometimes a little bit of a headache. Uh, but other than that, we're working through it, working with DHL, trying to make it a smooth experience. We know that someone from Thailand, uh, got their season one box like six months later. Oh, no. uh, so, so there's there's a couple of hiccups here and there um but you know since then we've switched our shipping and just try to make it smoother and smoother and just constantly always trying to improve and figure out you know what are the challenges from last season how can we make things better you know well so when it comes to selecting the coffees how do you go about selecting the coffees and how well how why is this attractive to roasters to participate yeah i mean so for um, for selecting the coffees, it's, it's kind of a fun challenge, I think on our end to select the coffees because we want it to be a really good learning experience. And so the, the 10 coffees are a huge part of the learning experience. So when we put a coffee in leaderboard, the question is always, okay, what do we think people are going to think this coffee is? What do we want to teach people from this coffee? Um, so last season we included a washed coffee from China and, that was definitely a little bit of a curveball. Like not many people have tried coffees from China. And I think that was like an amazing learning experience for people where they're tasting this coffee blind and they don't really know what it is, but they need to try and understand the different characteristics that equal the puzzle of a Chinese coffee. And so hopefully through the reveal and through the tasting next time, if they do end up trying a Chinese coffee, it'll be a really good learning experience for them. So. For us, that is something we think a lot about when we're trying to put this box together is like, how do we make the best learning experience for our participants? Um, now, when it comes to roasters participating, there's like two sides. So roasters, I think really enjoy it, like playing themselves. So we have a roaster in Edmonton called Transcend Coffee. They're like one of the better specialty coffee roasters here in Canada. And they ended up buying like four different leaderboard boxes, one for each cafe. And they kind of turned it into like this little internal training game for their whole company, um, which I thought was pretty awesome, a pretty cool thing to see. Um, so from that perspective, roasters are really enjoying it in terms of participating. And then for the roasters that we feature, I think they really enjoy it because, you know, the participants are very much like diving into their coffee. They're tasting it and really thinking about what they're tasting. And I think, you know, for a roaster, the, what you really want is you want people to try your coffee. Um, and you want people to learn about your brand. And I think that's what we do exceptionally well for, for the roasters who are on our platform. It's like the people who are participating are totally going to dive into your coffee and they're going to like know it like the back of their hand. And then when we do the reveal, it's a good opportunity for the roasters to share their brand and what makes them interesting and kind of give their, you know, give their spiel about why this coffee is cool. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about diving into the coffees and knowing it like the back of your hand, you're talking about a coffee roaster retailer's dream uh, for their workforce, for, exactly. the, for the baristas. Um, and it seems to me that, like you said, that there was that uh, Transcend in Edmonton that did the leaderboard coffee for their cafes. I imagine a, a, a roaster could do or maybe has been inspired to do an internal similar internal competition or gamification, you know, thing with their own coffees blind and with, totally. with their companies. Have you seen anybody kind of say, Hey, this is a great idea. I'm going to keep doing this. Um, maybe not with the leaderboard coffee box, but with just our own coffees. I ha we haven't seen anyone do that yet, but I think that's an awesome idea. Um, I know that like, even for myself personally, like I would have loved to do that on my own. Um, just like, put myself through the ringer and see how good of a taster I am. And I think the biggest challenge is just having to set that up. So like part of our inspiration is from cup tasters. Uh, Cause I think cup tasters is such a cool coffee competition. Yeah. But for myself, like you need to have 27 coffees available and you need to ask someone to set that up for you, <laughs> which is kind of like a logistics pain in the butt. Right. Um, so I think that like, I think I definitely think that roasters should do this internally if they want to learn more about their own coffees or if they want to like practice their skills, then check us out at leaderboard.coffee and hopefully we can help help them do a little practice session. Oh, 100%. And one of the things that you really do get a lot out of is is trying other people's coffees. 
um, in figuring out like to where is the industry right now in terms of you know specialty coffee? It, because as we were talking before we recorded, you know, um, I've it was describing what coffee was like twenty years ago, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and it's different. It's different. It's different today. And if you're an older roaster, you need to kind of move with the times. If you're a newer roaster, you need to know where you stand. So this kind of a thing seems very useful for kind of calibrating what what you're offering and where you stand in in maybe even the international market. Totally, I noticed that for sure. Like we, I talked to some roasters after they participated, and you know especially just the international side of things. Like we had some roasters from Sweden. And so just like trying the Norwegian or like the Scandinavian coffees and their roast styles compared to the American or the Canadian styles, just back to back, I think is definitely like an interesting taste comparison. So not necessarily just the coffees, but just the different roast styles of the different roasters international. Yeah. And one of the caveats I find myself often, you know, saying when it comes to comparisons is that usually comparisons are really good when you're trying to get a gauge for a general, like here you are, like a a map in the mall, like you are here. Uh, And it it can turn a little bit weird when you start to get really nervous that your coffee is not exactly like a famous roaster's coffee because you start taking your attention off of your consumers, the people that are actually buying your coffees locally and wholesale clients and and then put putting the emphasis on, you know, wanting to be as good as somebody that's 3000 miles away. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think really all it comes down to is like understanding what your customers want and what sort of profile you want to put forward as a coffee roasting company, right? Like we're all not going to be Tim Wendelbo, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a weird sci-fi movie where we all wake up and we are all Tim Wendelbo. <laughs> Let's see. I, as we're talking about the industry, I, I'm thinking more more along the lines of like where you see the industry going because you've got the access to all these coffees and they're in and out of your hands and you're cupping them and uh, you've got to see some trends and I would be interested in learning from you. Like where, where do you see the industry now? Like what, what, how would you define what specialty coffee is now and where is it going? What are the trends that you've seen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we were talking about this a little bit before and I think, you know, what we were saying pretty much nailed it on the head. Like I think there's sort of two vibes that I'm noticing within specialty coffee where some people are just really pushing the boundaries on flavor profiles and really trying to expand past this like quote unquote status of specialty coffee um, and seeing what we can create. So we're seeing like some really fascinating carbonic maceration or anaerobically processed coffees that have these like insane flavor profiles of super jammy strawberry or watermelon candy, just coffee flavor profiles that would have probably, you know, blown our mind like 10 years ago. Uh, so I've, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of that, but then, you know, the other thing that we were talking about was the other end of the spectrum where people are just like really heavily focusing on good quality, um, equitable lots. So Mm -hmm. whether that's like solid blends that just nail a coffee profile or, um, yeah, like a very solid chocolatey cup of coffee. It's nothing that's going to be like mind blowing, but something that they know, okay, this is a very sustainable relationship. And, you know, I think there's room for both in the industry. I think that like the industry probably needs both actually. Mm -hmm. I think the experimental lots, stuff like that is what's going to push coffee forward almost a little bit like barista competitions. So you put all this effort into this and then you see what happens. Uh, I was mentioning this to to you early, but like a really great example is some of the interesting varietals we're seeing. So stuff like Central Americano. I love that varietal because it's done super well at Cup of Excellence. Uh, it makes a, It's like got Ethiopian genetics, but it's also got robust genetics. So it's going to be amazing for cup quality, but also do really well against some of the challenges like pests um, or climate change. And I think that like finding these interesting, unique var- varietals is what will help the mass um, coffee growers, they might not be the fanciest lots of coffee down the road, but this is the stuff that I think is going to help us when we need to figure out solutions to deal with climate change and deal with rust and deal with potentially pests. So, you know, I think that they very much go hand in hand for the future of coffee. Okay. Uh, here's a, a, a bit of a, a, another layer of that question is, is 
where is the urgency to explore coming from in terms of experimental lots? I mean, it's, I know partially it's you know trying to come up with ways to combat climate change, and others are to satisfy a very high end niche um, uh, industry, part of the industry. Um, when it comes to what you've experienced with what roasters are offering, I mean, how much of this, in your opinion, is is generated as a result of a response to what roasters want versus what farmers need? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like it's probably more to what roasters want, realistically. Um, but then at the same extent, I noticed some green buyers, some people are like very specific with what they choose to buy. And, uh, you know, like... For example, there's some roasters up here in Canada. I'm going to give a shout out to a roaster named Rabbit Hole Roasters. And they do a lot of work with investing in, let's say, up and coming origins. So that Chinese coffee we bought, uh, I don't think it's in the same echelon as some of these like crazy experimental lots. But I think the only way specialty coffee is going to grow in a place like China is if roasters give them a shot before they're at that quality level. So I think stuff like this does require investment to get to that next step. And, you know, we've been featuring coffee from Rabbit Hole in China for the past few years, and we're noticing that progression in cup quality. So the first year, it was it was okay, Uh, And then second and third year, you're just noticing more sweetness, more complexity. And so, yeah, I I mean, like, I think a lot of roasters probably buy coffees because they think it's really cool and fun and not necessarily because it's what the producer or specialty coffee needs as a whole. But I do notice some roasters are very like in tune with making sure their green buying decisions are going to be stuff that's going to benefit the industry down the road, which I think is really important and something we should definitely like make sure we support as consumers. Yeah. So there's there's the kind of like the the flavor experiments and then the equity experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good way of putting it for sure. So um, when it comes to the industry at large, like using the quote unquote industry, like all okay. these millions of people. Yeah. Um, what do you feel that we need to embrace in the let's see, let's say just retail coffee, retail coffee roasters? We have, especially after COVID, you know, we we have a lot more emphasis on online distribution. Um, I don't, I don't want to say less on wholesale, but I think people are starting to realize that the market for direct to consumer can sometimes be more reliable than wholesale. Um, in, in, we just saw that recently. So uh, when we're interacting with consumers and we're focusing on education, making them successful with our coffee, so to speak, make, how would you advise us to, um, pursue and embrace educating consumers well, based on your experiences? Totally. So I think it all comes down to accessibility and education. And I think like, that's going to be different for each customer. And I think that's what the key is really, is understanding how do customers feel about your coffee? Do they look at the bags and feel a little bit intimidated because it says something like Nourinho 1600 meters above sea level and they have no idea what that means. Um, I think it. I think the question really is like, how do we expand past this group of passionate coffee nerds that are currently loving specialty coffee to bring it into a wider audience? And so, you know, to me, that that really comes down to accessibility and education. So teaching people more about coffee and how they can great, get a really delicious cup of coffee at home. Um, and then like explaining or understanding where the roadblocks are for people to dive into specialty coffee. So I would really focus on those two things. And I would try and talk to your customers as much as possible. Try and figure out like what challenges are they having? and How can you help break down some of those roadblocks? Yeah, really good point. We need to break ourselves out of our bubble, um, even if it's a fun bubble, you know, <laughs> and yeah. it's yeah. a, is a competition. Like you can get way into competition and be, you know, be way, uh, removed from the average consumer because your community of, uh, barista professional peers all love a particular coffee or profile, but, and then you wonder why, why do my consumers, you know, customers not like this coffee? It must be because they're wrong. Or, <laughs> mm-hmm. or, you know, we we sort of an us versus them mentality. It does it does seem like empathy and finding more bridges uh, for, to to go uh, across to where the consumer is coming from 
it, it has become more of a, a market, not more of a marketing strategy, but a, a just way of doing business, I guess. Yeah, totally. And I think it's strictly just because like, you know, as roasters, we relied very heavily on the cafe, right? And so the cafe was the distribution channel, I guess. And so we would teach the head barista, but we wouldn't necessarily have the interaction with the customer as much as we probably could. And now, as you mentioned, like direct to consumer is very much becoming a thing. And so we're no longer just talking with the one nerdy head barista uh, at the coffee shop. We're talking with these individuals, like they might be like 70 years old trying to figure out how to dial in their coffee. And we need to like figure out how to talk to them about coffee rather than talk to the person who's also very nerdy and wants to talk extraction and TDS and water with us. Yeah. Don't forget those 70 year olds, man. They got some expendable income. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's surprising. Like we have customers for our original subscription, the roasters pack, like in places I would have never expected, uh, just super rural Canada, not the quote unquote, like hipster specialty coffee nerd, you know, the archetype that we imagine, uh, good coffee is for everyone, you know, mm. man, put that on a t-shirt. Good yeah, coffee is yeah. for everyone. Uh, exactly. Well, uh, obviously, this is what you're all about doing is bringing it to everybody and through Leaderboard Coffee and uh, your subscription services. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show and talk about all of this. Um, how can we find out more about uh, Leaderboard Coffee and participate in this uh, competition, this game? Absolutely. So we've got uh, season three, which the cutoff is coming up July 15th. Um, but each season... Uh, we have signups for three months before. So if you miss out on season three, you can get in on season four. Uh, and so just go to leaderboard.coffee and you can find us there. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be the best spot for you guys to go. You can check us out on Instagram too. Instagram, uh, our, we're Leaderboard Coffee. And I think we've got some really cool stuff on there and you, you'll be able to get a good vibe of what the whole experience is all about. Awesome. Sunil, it's been really great to talk to you. Thanks again for being on the show. Chris, thanks for having me. It was awesome to be here. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode and I hope that it gave you some things to think about in what you might be able to do in your own roastery or maybe you want to participate in Leaderboard Coffee. Go check them out over at leaderboard.coffee to find out what's uh, coming up in the next season of the competition. And a huge thank you to Sunil for uh, spending time with us today at Keys to the Shop. So again, if you want more information, just go to leaderboard.coffee and you can also follow them on Instagram over at Leaderboard Coffee. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback for me about this show or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, just reach out via email. My email is chris at keys to the shop.com. Look forward to a hearing from you, how we can improve the show, what your thoughts are on these topics. So again, that email, chris at keys to the shop. Now, speaking of coffee education, Coffee Fest trade shows are coming up. The next two, the last two for this year, are in Anaheim, California. That's in August. That's the 22nd through the 24th. And then in November in Portland, Oregon. Go to coffeefest.com to learn more information. Coffee Fest has spent over 25 years bringing accessible, high relevance, high substance educational content and networking to specialty coffee retailers. This is the best show to attend. If you want to be energized, educated, resourced, learn how to thrive as a coffee entrepreneur, go check out all of the lectures, the uh, workshops, trainings, competitions, and trade show floor. All that information is available over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today. Thanks everybody so much for taking the time to join me again. I really appreciate you all sharing these episodes, rating and reviewing the show. Be sure to subscribe and I hope you have an awesome day. And of course, I hope as always that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.